key is a day of discussions, and then we're going to, obviously everybody's going to be presenting their paper, but we're going to leave plenty of time for discussions after the paper presentations and during coffee breaks, and at the very end of the day, we'd like to have a brainstorming session where everyone is involved to try and focus on particular themes that are in uh, common among the folks in the room and perhaps folks not in the room. Um, so I should begin by thanking HCEO and INET. So a lot of them are out there, but we've got a chance to thank them formally at the end. And of course, Steve, Gerloff, <coughs> and Jim, who's not here yet, for bringing us all together. So we're going to begin with, oh, what we, what we begin with is going around the room and everybody saying their name. I know we have name taps, but at least just saying your name, um, you know, your uh, institutional affiliation. This um, cheat sheet, this book has this nice biography of everyone in it. So as you're going along the day and wondering, so gee, what is that person up to? Where are they? What's their research on? There's little bios in here, which will help us for those who aren't familiar with everyone. So, so why don't we go around the room first, everyone will give their name, um, and then we'll start with very short presentations uh, from the four of us, just on kind of what we're up to, what we are, we're thinking we might be able to discuss today. Um, the other uh, note of business is when we do the presentations, um, when the presentations come along of the actual of the speakers and papers, uh, we have labeled here framing and discussion. What that was meant is just to bookend the talk with just a short, you know, so this is, you know, Aldo or whomever it is, and then, then we're leaving 15 minutes for discussion among the participants, not necessarily a discussant. I've heard people ask, there's no discussant per se of the paper, right? It's just that we're going to have, hopefully have discussion among the participants of the conference. So great, so why don't we start going around the room? I'm Joe Cable. I'm in the psychology department at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Thomas Lowe. I'm at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm David Huffman. I'm an economist at Swarthmore College. I'm in five economists at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Tim Kautz. I'm a graduate student in economics at U Chicago. I'm Richard Graves. I'm a senior fellow in economic studies at Brookings Institute. I'm Ian Kotze, University of Bonn, also economics. I'm Jake Picasso. I'm a post PA researcher at the Economics Department. You should have. I'm Mary Claire Griffin. I'm also a post PA researcher at the University of Chicago. I'm Allison Balasa, I'm a coach in Hickman. I'm Kimberly Yang. I'm a master's student at U Chicago, and I work for HCU. I'm Rebecca Shiner, and I'm in the psychology department at Cooking. I'm Stephen Gerlach, an economist from the University of Wisconsin. I'm Liz Shulman. I am a postdoc in the psychology department. University of Pennsylvania and Temple University. Tommy Fathnerby, I'm a neuroscientist at the Yale School of Medicine. David Yeager, I'm a developmental psychologist at the University of Texas. Dan McAdams, psychology department at Northwestern. Greg Walton, I'm a psychologist at Stanford. Josh Jackson, I'm a personality psychologist at Washington University. Angela Duckworth, a psychologist at University of Pennsylvania. Paul Lewis McGee, economics at the University of Minnesota. Paul Garendel, and Media coordinator for this year. I guess I didn't say who I was. I'm Rachel Cranton, um, I'm the economics department at Duke. So I think we'll start with our four um, short presentations. Yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, I know some of you pretty well, and I'm just going to extrapolate to the rest of you. You're all incredibly busy. So, um, so we're really going to try to make this a worthwhile day. That said, the aims of this working group are still evolving. So uh, this is actually the only meeting we've had so far of this uh, identity and personality group. We're hoping that what happens today gives some shape, uh, not only to some specific projects that we hope would emerge from it, collaboration, but, but for the rest of our group. Uh, I want to keep our remarks brief because I know we're going to eventually run behind schedule, especially when Jim shows up. So um, I thought that I would just say something about terminology. Uh, Jim Heckman and Steve and I uh, spent a few years trying to think about questions related to those that we're dealing with today. And it seems like one of the major obstacles to true interdisciplinary work is that the terminology is, is distinct and the implicit assumptions, which uh, actually are never entirely aired within your discipline because everyone's sort of walking around with roughly the same beliefs and, uh, and understanding, um, it's, it's not necessary. Um, one thing I'll say on behalf of psychologists, I think, is that we hate the word non-cognitive. It makes no sense. 
you know, like when you start to try to defend it, it's like not cognitive, not not to do with the brain. No, we, you know, everything in psychology more or less has to do with the brain. Not having to do with information processing. Pretty much everything has to do with information processing, including personality, attitudes, uh, you know, confidence, etc. So the term non-cognitive, I think, persists for the reason that it is a useful moniker for referring to everything except general cognitive ability. So you know, what is what is whatever the G factor is, or you know, the first factor extracted from IQ test, whatever this kind of general ability to learn, etc. Um, I think uh, those of us who are, you know, still use the word non-cognitive reluctantly say, well, that can't be the only dimension of human capital uh, that's important, uh, that's consequential. So I think that the term non-cognitive, I'm willing to live with it, um, and that, frankly, I don't have a, a better term, except for possibly, I think in, in Jim and Tim's recent work, uh, you're calling it non-cognitive, well, you're calling it character skills, which both has a connotation of um, buildability, malleability, and change, and, and also this idea that uh, there's some stability there, and, and character, I think, actually, uh, if you go back enough in history, is a terrific term. Uh, maybe you have to go really far back, but I actually like that. So, okay, on terminology, I think um, it's going to be something where uh, if you don't understand what a preference is, you know, then you have to ask. I mean, I'm speaking for the psychologist asking the economist, but vice versa. Um, I think that uh, one thing that Jim and I, and uh, to some extent Tim more recently, have worked on is a general model for personality. And it's not entirely new, but I think it's useful to uh, summarize here. In, you know, uh, Dan and I were talking about some older theorizing in the personality literature, which I think is completely consonant with this. I think it's useful to distinguish between patterns of behavior. Uh, you know, this person tends to show up on time, this person tends to talk aloud at parties, from the antecedents of those patterns of behavior. And I think some people use the word personality trait to refer to both. Some to the underlying things that give rise to the patterns, and some to just the patterns. But you know, there is a descriptive level uh, of describing kind of patterns of behavior across situations and time. And then there really is, I think, the more explanatory level, which, you know, we would argue is more interesting, but you know, motivations, beliefs, schema, uh, capabilities, and so forth, that give rise to this person talking a lot at parties or raising their hand a lot at class. But I think that, uh, at least in our model, we try to parse overt behaviors from underlying psychological antecedents uh, while acknowledging the facts, uh, effects of situations, et cetera. Um, and then finally, I'll just close with what I think are emerging as common themes between the economists in the room and the psychologists in the room, I think we're all concerned with good measurement, and I think we're um, all very aware of the limitations of current measures. So I think it would be a terrific thing if um, at some point some subgroup of us uh, work together, actually, on new measurable development. Um, I know for sure there's a common interest in intervention, you know, taking what we know and actually making kids in particular uh, better off. Um, and then finally, I guess, I don't know, Steve, are you going to give a grand unifying uh, vision of HCO at some point? Because if you are, then I'll, I'll just stop there. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, I'm an interloper to this meeting in the sense that it's not an area that I do research in, so I'm strictly a consumer, and I'm especially grateful uh, that, uh, they, uh, that I'll have a chance to learn today. Uh, what Angela was at, and I, I hope you're co organizers. Uh, uh, what I'm going to do is make a few comments about um, the, the objectives of the ACO as, a, as an organization and how we envision the next uh, five plus years of uh, uh, evolving. Uh, the background is that uh, there's an organization called the uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking, which was uh, founded <coughs> by very uh, wealthy individuals uh, in the wake of the financial crisis. Uh, you might be shocked to hear that they uh, were not impressed with the uh, performance of the economists in both prediction and uh, ex post uh, understanding of the phenomenon. And their explicit intent was to fund research that was outside the box, as the uh, as a cliche goes. As this organization itself evolved, it became apparent that uh, that the, both the, the donors and the advisors were very deep interested in quality, and that led to uh, some fellow by the name of James Heckman, who's just 
not the end of the back, uh, <laughs> uh, starting, uh, starting this initiative uh, for the grant. And uh, in, in essence, where HDO is, is that now a set of networks, which is this one that are pursuing research on this uh, incredible, complicated, we've got to develop a vector boundary area of inequality. Uh, and so what Andrew uh, was, was alluding to is the vision that uh, Jim and I are in conversation about uh, as to the future of the of the initiative, and this includes the renewal process, but we're going to be uh, hopefully we'll have the grant renewed and, uh, and the resource base expanded. And uh, since I have the microphone, I can take my vision. <laughs> and <laughs> somebody could disagree if uh, it's gap uh, So the serious point is that uh, what Ideally, we would like to emerge from from the HCO project uh, as some as a capstone, and maybe and I bring it up now really as an organizing principle is the ability or the, is the, to, to, to be very specific that you and I are able to put together uh, capstone points that are comprehensive visions of aspects of inequality. So when I talk about uh, Leader class now is intergenerational. So there's an issue where uh, you know, there's uh, an embarrassment of riches when it comes to theorizing or body empirical work. But there's fundamental questions of how one integrates different perspectives and at the end is able to synthesize them in a way and understand relative empirical salience and how one would, uh, uh, in principle, think about uh, policy interventions uh, in ameliorating aspects of or altering aspects of, uh, of mobility. And so that's uh, an admittedly an extraordinarily uh, ambitious thing to put on the table. And it only one facet of inequality, an entire separate set of issues of understanding and quality across the life course. So the, the point of, of putting some, something you know, that ambitious on the table is, as I said, is, is an organizing principle. In other words, what we're, our, our desire for the networks is First of all, you do the research you're passionate about, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's just, it's not, uh, you know, you know, feel this is a compliment to this uh, this broader vision. But at the end, what we'd like to see the various networks are contributing towards giving the building blocks from which this uh, this synthesis can be uh, can be constructed. And so uh, that's really uh, all I want to say is that uh, you know, the perspective of this network or others. That it maybe it's useful to think of a little bit of theological perspective that, that there is something that we want to come out of this in terms of the capacity to, to get a, a comprehensive synthesis of what's known, what's unknown, how one would mean to talk about policy and, uh, as appropriate, discuss uh, its implications uh, uh, on normal dimensions. You know, push that a little bit. There's been theories about distributed justice. Uh, and uh, one of the things, and this is a place where I'll say I, I, I personally dabble, but more seriously, the, the literature is not well informed theoretically, or informed empirically. What I mean by that is one of the contributions of this agenda that I'm going to I, uh, hope make is to give the empirical undergrading for taking abstract concepts into the quality of opportunity and asking what they mean in practice and what it would be for policy, turbine, et cetera. So I think I've probably already I would like to talk very briefly about our group in Bonn is currently doing. The purpose of showing you what we are doing is basically to inform you what we do <laughs> uh, and um, to make it possible for you to, to say, look, this is interesting, I'd like to team up, maybe this is an collaboration. This is actually what this network is all about. There are no formal ways to cooperate, but if we don't cooperate at all, uh, I think it would be uh, it would be a shame. From looking at what you are doing, I know that um, when we talk about intervention studies and understanding and whatnot, there's very much a uh, common interest approach for very uh, different angles. I would like you to, to get to know uh, what I and my group is interested in, such that you will be able to uh, you know, connect to them if you like. So, 
with respect to this particular group here, I would like to talk about two topics and briefly comment on some of the methods we use. So the first topic is really very broadly speaking personality. Uh, it would be a little bit more precise than what I mean. Angela has already talked a little bit about measurement issues. Uh, when I talk about personality, what I really mean is economic preferences, how the skills that you particular and standard psychological measures of personality, like close to control, heart, etc. And what we're doing in this research project, in this, in this uh, line of research, is try to get better measures. Um, when it comes to measuring preferences, for example, but also when it comes to find out behavioral measures for personality. We talked about this briefly yesterday. For example, we have developed one tool to measure conscientiousness and the behavioral task. I think it's actually popular in some of the uh, side measures that I use nowadays, which are all, as far as I know, these uh, based on survey evidence. Um, so, what we are interested in is measurement issues. We are interested in where these personality traits are coming from, the origin, um, how they develop over the life cycle, and of course also how they affect economic and social outcomes in general. So some of the projects we are currently working on is um, to investigate with a very large number of uh, kids aged eight who are social economic status. This is something that I'm working on with my father Costa, who's also here. Um, Another paper we're interested in, again, looking at the life circumstances and finding out uh, how these early life circumstances affect the development of uh, the <coughs> nature of our personality is uh, breastfeeding. And what we do here is, for example, we have breastfeeding durations in various data sets, and we have very precise measures of people pregnancy, and we look at how breastfeeding duration is mistaking, uh, intertemporal discounting. Social in another study, we're looking at the heritability for individual preferences. This is one of the preferences, one of the preferences that has received very little attention. And one of the reasons is it's very difficult to measure. Right? We have pretty well established tools for risk taking, for discounting, and social preferences. But we don't have good measures so far for one individual preference and the work means. And we're using a twin sample to find out whether there's some heritability in terms of what we prefer working on. Um, one really big project is to study the long-term development um, of personality, and this is really a vector of things. This is including all kinds of uh, preferences, personality indicators, knowing much about the uh, social demographic background, including preferences of personality for parents, and we will follow these 700 children for the next 15 years to study in particular the development of uh, these preferences in concept but also in isolation, look okay. at cross fertilization, complementarism, etc., and how these development uh, uh, of personality is interacted with the social environment. These people will all be part uh, of a regular German social economic panel, so they will be interviewed every year, and we will complement these interviews with uh, specific experiments and preferences and things that we are interested in in the given year. <coughs> I don't think much is known about these long-term developments at this point in the longitudinal study. Right? There are several cross-sectional studies on social problems, for example, if you compare uh, four-year-old uh, kids with eight-year-old and twelve-year-old kids, for example, this is all cross-sectional data. And if you're interested, for example, rank stability or rank order of, of these kids, you need a longitudinal study. Also, if you're interested in how the co-evolution of different uh, personality traits is actually going on. You need a broad set of indicators and measures and follow these states all the long period of time. Now this is uh, including an intervention study which is which has just come to an end. It's a one-year intervention, it's a mentoring program, roughly 140 kids to part, with some first results, it seems that after this year, um, participants in this mentoring program have a slightly higher IQ compared to the control group. Um, this is basically focusing on kids from a low social background. And knowing this intervention at age eight and then following on the next 15 years will also allow to get that somewhat more causal evidence on the role of personality of later in the talk. Because at this point, most of the evidence is really correlational in nature. We know 
you can measure the dials, um, labor market, from health outcomes, for example, you can call it and with a good five personality or preference measures. Um, but this is only a correlation of evidence. Um, this intervention study will also allow to look at the causal effects of personality on labor life outcomes. Causal because when we sign into this kind of problem took place. Um, this is one, one thing I mentioned already, which is the consequence of personality for labor life outcomes. Labor market outcomes health is particularly important uh, in this respect. It's also related to um, the overarching topic of this uh, research initiative, looking at health inequalities. Uh, one aspect is intergenerational transmission. We've worked on this in, in several papers now. Fabian has a nice paper on intergenerational intergeneration transmission. David Huffman and Thomas Zuma, you know, that paper. We'll look at the uh, transmission of risk preferences and trust and uh, where some relations controlling from uh, a huge set of control benefits. Uh, and then broadening the perspective, we're also interested in, in preferences on a global level. And when I say global, I actually mean global. Um, here we're interested in cult cultural, think about language, for example, religion, etc., origins, and also countrywide consequences of heterogeneating uh, preferences around the world. Um, to this end, we've collected data on, on risk preferences, discounting social preferences on a representative basis in 75 countries. Uh, this is how the uh, world of our study runs together. To give you an example, this is how time preferences are distributed around the world. I'm not going into any detail here. The more red it is, the more inflation people are, the, the lighter it gets, you know, the more patient people are. You see a substantial variation in the 75 countries. This is roughly 100,000 populations. Uh, the second topic I'd like to mention here is morality. This is something I, I'm working on currently right now, pretty heavily. And the key question is why do we act the moral? This is essentially the key question that is uh, motivating in this uh, research here. And two key factors are, of course, the personality of people, of course, but also the institutions um, in which they interact. Okay, so the idea is uh, take the same two people and put them into different institutions, and the moral outcomes will be drastically different. We've shown this um, in one paper uh, where we compare individual decision making to decision making in the markets and show that more or less tend to avoid in these market interactions. We have another paper uh, which we just did looking at. Uh, group behavior and group behavior leads to notions of diffuse pivotality. We don't think they are responsible any longer. Uh, if they have that belief and if everybody shares this belief, then you think you're no longer responsible, then um, this is what we observe. People think they can easily uh, uh, act morally. We see many more moral transgressions in these groups rather than uh, individual decision making. Again, this is for the same set of people when I'm assigned to different institutions. Okay. Um, another aspect is, and this is now focusing more on the personality side, what are the determinants of moral behavior? Uh, in terms of uh, in five, for example, we find that women tend to be more morally, uh, more moral than, than males. People are at the far right in the political spectrum, uh, celebrating uh, less moral than people on the middle or the left spectrum of the we also find that people are somewhat smarter, uh, seem to be more moral, and also less smart. This is only a simple so we don't have a full distribution of IQ here, but there's surprisingly substantial variation in the amount of students. Um, another aspect, this is coming back to the sample I was looking at before, is more development in children, so where there is, uh, this was the survey based uh, indicators of morality. Moral transgression, etc. And again, we're interested in the interaction of social and demographic environment, uh, institutions, uh, family background, um, and other preference and uh, personality indicators in shaping or developing the children. I'm also currently planning and actually running to intervention studies on moral behavior. Here, the idea is really how to teach people to become more moral. So, this is a slightly more methodistic uh, approach than all the Stuff I've talked about before. Uh, one in students, another study is in uh, a representative sample. The representative sample will be 
the, the only two groups, essentially one group uh, will be informed of one year or the consequence of consumption or consequences like um, the third part is think about meat production, uh, poor working conditions in developing countries, etc. etc. The other group, the control group, will also receive information which is uh, not related to more or consumption issues and then after one year we will look at consumption behaviors in both groups and follow them uh, for several years. This is again something that can come from the German social and find out the more education is lasting and has an effect on the consequences of the more time period. This is also very much related to uh, what Rachel is working on. Uh, a very important aspect of moral behavior is moral identity or self image. And in one of our intervention studies, we want to work on, this is a single sample here, uh, shaping their self image either into, uh, towards being a more moral person versus being a more selfish person. Maybe see how that creates a sense of, of moral identity and more positive or more negative self image. And then uh, see if that affects uh, later decisions and more relevant uh, decision context. Okay, um, finally, let me briefly talk about methods, and I think this is also quite relevant for this quite heterogeneous group here. This has become clear probably um, my main tool or tools main tool is uh, experiments, field experiments, lab experiments, interventions in your life. Uh, one key advantage of running experiments is you can fairly precisely measure preferences, or at least attitudes. I don't want to go too far here, can you can observe preferences, but that's, that's a specific issue here. Um, in a controlled and incentive collective way, what that means is uh, people are facing trade offs between money and, 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 and uh, actions, and this allows us to, to for the same uh, decision problems, keeping stakes, probabilities, decision problems, etc. constantly, you see how people uh, act in the way they do. Experts are also very useful in pairing institutions in the controlled environment, think about this marketing versus individual capital, for example, the same people in various institutions, and this is something that the lab really allows. And uh, it's really that, that it's, uh, I would say, in this particular case, it's much more possible. Another set of uh, uh, instruments is surveys, standards, I don't know if you do, but we're talking about skills. We also use what we call experimental evaluated preference measures. Uh, think about the world preference map that I showed you before in terms of the discounting. These, uh, um, this data is. Um, uh, these data come from, from surveys, and the survey questions that we ask people and uh, translate into you know, all these languages and patterns and blah 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 were all experimentally valid in the following sense. Uh, roughly 450 subjects took part in a series of experiments where they took part in incentive or multiple reference experiments like this, and also answered a whole set of questions related to the specific references. And then we selected on the basis of the decisions questions that predict that these are uh, And these questions are then used for this uh, survey. Uh, and in that sense, it's an experimental and preference. Right? We also use parametric measures like MRI, uh, hardware therapy, eye tracking, uh, hormone studies in Germany, and also the others we take care uh, to, to get a uh, measure of the cortisol level, which is related to stress in the last months, uh, which is also an important outcome in potential of this information stuff, right? Perhaps people who are taking part in this intervention in this mentoring program uh, are supposed to be less stress and this could be measured in a if you like physical way. And then finally, um, if possible and if, if informative, uh, we always try to combine various uh, tools to get you know the same question but from different methodological approaches. We've done this several times now, in particular combined with experiments and survey data, but also by measures and surveys or more That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll also just do a, yeah, you know, I'm joking. Uh, I'll also just do a little bit of an introduction to uh, uh, what I've been working on and, uh, and why I'm here and, and how I can get into so the, the, um, the things that we're going to be talking about today in this group. So I'll tell you a little bit about 
three kinds of things that I've been working on. My, uh, my training is as a neuroscientist, first and foremost, so I'm neither a personality psychologist nor an economist uh, at the beginning of the day, although I, I developed and used to go. Um, uh, so the kinds of things we do um, in my research group, one of the things that we're interested in is neural measures of individual differences in decision making. So I'm very interested in individual differences in what an economist might call time preference. Um, a psychologist might call uh, discounting or future time perspective. Um, and we've uh, uh, been spending a lot of time uh, developing, uh, looking at what kinds of brain measures predict individual differences in time preference, predict the people who will uh, choose the later rewards when you give them incentivized trade-offs. Um, you know, a recent example of this is that the best uh, brain, the best predictor that we have, we've discovered in my lab is a, is a brain measure of activity in uh, you know, two areas that are, are very involved in decision making while individuals are engaged in, in prospective thought about the future. So if we give them a very uh, minimalist intervention to think about two weeks from now or a month from now or a year from now, the individuals who are most likely to take uh, most likely to have a lower degree of discounting, so put higher valuations on the future, have more activity in these brain regions when they're thinking about a year from now than the individuals, uh, and while the individuals who uh, are more likely to put less valuation on that future reward have less activity in these brain regions, just when we give them a minimal intervention think about a year from now. Um, uh, and that has led us, for example, to think about what the role of prospective thought might be um, in time preference and understand what what might be going on when individuals are, what's the, what's the psychological process when individuals have to construct a future, have to construct an alternative um, a, a, a reality about a year from now that is, uh, that, that's different across individuals and can explain individual differences in time. We're also interested not just in who chooses uh, to work for the future, but in their persistence in that choice, so not just what uh, economists would call time preference, but what Angela would call grit. Um, there's a profound uncertainty. Uh, for example, when you decide to uh, develop a new school, uh, skill, when you decide to engage in, in educational uh, training, for example, there's a profound uncertainty about when you will achieve what you're working towards, and will you achieve it sooner or will you achieve it later? Um, and the idea that we're exploring is whether some of the individual differences in grit and persistence originate from a difference in your prior beliefs about how about when that success will occur. <laughs> so if you think success <laughs> only occurs after a long period of prolonged effort, then having been engaged in this activity for a short period of time does not distress you. Without the same results does not distress you. Uh, whereas if you think success occurs very quickly, uh, having engaged in this in, in this training exercise for a short period of time without seeing results distresses you and may lead you to a, to abandon it and not do uh, grit. Um, and so that's led us to, to to some very basic questions, taking us back into understanding the neurobiology of it, of trying to understand uh, brain measures of. Of, of, of prior release and how does the brain represent expectations and a bunch of questions that I think neuroscientists uh, are, are, have, have, have had absolutely little <laughs> or, or almost nothing to say about that. Uh, the third uh, kind of project that I wanted to mention in terms Just, of... Can I ask you a question? Though? Sure. Is there that much variation across human beings? I mean, so you're looking at brains, but I'm just wondering how much variability there is. Or do you look at damage to the brain and sort of say, well, People who are damaged in this region, or they can they compensate? I just, I'm just asking about the research. So, so there, there is variability. So there, there are a lot of different, there are a lot of different measures you might take uh, of right. brain. So, so the the one study that I talked about was looking at variability in in uh, brain activity while the, we've been, we've asked them to engage in a in a task where this was just a simple, you know, think about two weeks from now, or think about a year from now task. Um, if you're talking about you know task variability, there's you know there's, there's depending on I think especially as you move into unconstrained tasks, there's more variability across individuals as you might expect as the as the context of the task um, 
becomes more constrictive that you can reduce the error across individuals. That's, that's just uh, uh, that's a functional activity. Uh, there's a lot of structural differences at, at the individual level as well. And we're trying to get a handle on, on different measures of functional differences. So both, you know, not just, I think a lot of the work so far has been very, you know, we're starting with what the easiest thing to measure is, which is you know, how big is that chunk versus how big is that chunk. But you can be much more sophisticated in terms of uh, looking, for example, at the thickness of the gray matter, the density of the connections uh, between areas, uh, and uh, explore those as, as individual differences measures as well. Um, but, 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 but in terms of the research, yeah, certainly, so in terms of trying to understand human diversity, that's what we're doing. In terms of trying to understand the the brain, so trying to understand what is you know what is this network doing, neural network doing versus what is this other neural network doing, the kinds of uh, 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 the kinds of things you suggest are very helpful when we do engage in. So studying populations where there's degeneration in certain networks, bottom networks versus posterior networks, and comparing behavioral performance across those two. Um, so so we have a collaboration with a clinical colleague where degeneration of the frontal uh, lobes causes a different pattern in terms of, uh, you know, if you were to classify them in terms of, in terms of the you know, time preference, risk preference, social preference, degeneration of the frontal lobe causes one trajectory of changes, whereas degeneration of the posterior lobes causes a different trajectory of changes. So that, I think that's a, you know, trying to understand, that, that's more of a basic question of what's the role of these different neural networks than a, yeah, understanding normal, <laughs> Uh, the normal range of human diversity. Okay. Um, so the last, uh, the last um, uh, research direction that I thought I'd mention, since many people in the, in the um, in this group are interested in intervention, we're also starting to do uh, some intervention studies there. I think uh, you know it's partly practical. So um, if you observe that certain kinds of preferences, say you know preference for delayed reward has a, has a positive effect on life outcomes, then natural next question is how might you uh, get individuals to, to, to be, to value the future more. Um, uh, I think for me it's actually more of a basic question, which is uh, if you can intervene and change how an individual is making a decision, you're actually demonstrating that you understand something about the process and what's causally relevant to them. Um, so we are also uh, uh, doing uh, both short-term you know, interventions uh, in terms of what, what, are, what are persuasive communications on one time, um, uh, uh, at one time that get people to make decisions in a different way, also long-term interventions. If you uh, have people try and build certain cognitive skills such as working memory, does that, uh, get them, uh, does that change their decision making? Um, so, so that's just an overview of some of the things, you know, in terms of uh, Harmon's goal of trying to make connections. So that's some of the things that I'm interested in, and I'm hoping to hear more about what everyone else is interested in uh, to try and make connections. Uh, but so why am I here? If I, you know, as I, I made this comment that I was uh, neither trained as a personality psychologist or an economist, <laughs> but I'm interested in both. Um, and I think it goes back to, given that, that my one of my fundamental interests is understanding goes back to what Angela was saying about uh, uh, the causal antecedents uh, distinguishing between observable behavior as a trait and the causal antecedents of that observable behavior. Um, and uh, why I'm interested, uh, what I think neuroscience and, and biology has to bring to the table is information that can inform our understanding, you know, goes deeper than measurement. It's really a question about what are the right constructs, and as I said yesterday, carving nature at its joints. And I think uh, bio neurobiologists have measures that can inform uh, our ability to carve nature at its joints at that uh, causal antecedent level. Um, I want to be careful to say that I don't, I, I, I you know, this isn't, uh, you know, neuroscience is going to <laughs> is going to answer the questions that personality psychologists haven't been able to get at for the past 50 years. This isn't a uh, a you know this is the one true way to, in order to answer this question uh, claim. 
it's more a claim of this is a very difficult, understanding the causal antecedents is a very difficult uh, 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 nut to crack. And I think that uh, part of why we're here is that uh, the personality is that personality psychologists have one piece of it. Um, I believe. Uh, I think economists have another piece of it, um, and I think that uh, if we add other measures as well from from, from neurobiology. I think and, and are able to to try and come to some integration of it. I think we may finally push forward and, and have progress at that level, at a at a deep level, sort of construct level as well as measurement level, um, in a way that if we work independently. Um, so that's my preparatory comments. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little sense of what um, what I um, think a lot about and what I hope we can um, talk about together in this group. And we heard a lot in what Joe was talking about just now was a lot about he's interested in individual differences, what I might call individual heterogeneity. But I'm also very interested in societal differences, in, in patterns of um, these, what all, everything that we've been talking up until now, you know, time preferences, um, grit, non-cognitive skills, you know, this whole body of traits, skills, this whole package that we're, we're trying to understand, define, measure, I'm very interested in how that um, varies within society um, across different groups within society. So I've done a lot of work on identity and economic decision making, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I'm thinking about things. So I have to say that one reason I'm interested in being part of this group um, and I'm interested in part of HCO is that I'm worried about inequality. And inequality is simply, you know, some people have more and some people have less. And you might ask, well, why do we care? You know, why do we care about inequality? Um, so a social scientist, we might say, I'm interested in describing such patterns. It's this interesting phenomenon. You know, I'd like to describe it. Um, and from an economist's point of view, you might say, well, is inequality good or bad for growth or development? So you might have a sort of functional question about inequality. But we also might just think that there's something about this inequality that we think is unjust or unfair. I mean, why are we all worried about kids that don't achieve in school? Why are we worried about that? We might think that it's not fair that some kids don't do as well as other kids. And it's particularly, probably, at least for me, particularly problematic or unjust when these inequalities are socially systematic. There are certain social groups that have more, end up having more, and others having less. So it's not just individual differences, right, that some people have grit and they do really well. It's that there's systematic social differences as well. And we're not sure why, right? I want to say we're not sure why. So inequality is not randomly distributed. In the United States, of course, and I'm just going to put this up, blacks and Hispanics would, we might think of having, you know, sort of on the lower end of the income distribution in France and in Europe, we can think of North Africans, Africans, the Roma, and so on. And in many parts of the world, women, right, are, have much worse outcomes than men, okay? So I just want to point out that this, these questions that we're talking about, about how people um, are making their economic decisions or these decisions are made for them is taking place within a social context and it's not you know just sort of this individual heterogeneity there's systematic heterogeneity okay and that's particularly what I think about so now let me tell you when I say identity so that word has so many different meanings and so many different disciplines so let me tell you what I mean when I say that so at a minimum, I can think of identity as a designator of a social group. So it's different than a personality or self-concept. Okay, so I want to think of identity here as, a, as the individual as in the social context, not just person, I don't, again, I'm going to you know, perhaps run roughshod over other terminology. Um, and so I want to understand how identity figures into inequality. Is it a mere descriptor? So we say some social groups face greater structural constraints. So some people are, you know, because of their immigrant status, actually attend worse schools, and okay, that's, that's it. You know, it's just a descriptor of, 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 the, of the particular situation we're in today. Or is identity a part of the processes that create and sustain inequality, right? So here we get into questions about intergenerational mobility and so on. Is somehow social identity and the social world part of the process which sustains inequality? So do different kids, for example, have different preferences? So different, say, disc, you know, preferences, time preferences. Do they have different norms about how they should be acting in school or not? 
Do they have different sense of belonging to different groups? So I know that people here have worked on various aspects of these things. So you know, the idea of belonging, for example, is coming up in research of the folks in the room. But I want to understand that belonging, in, again, you know, let's understand how that belonging fits within the social context and then works then its way through the individual decision making. So I'm thinking about the individual who's making some sort of decision, again, more or less consciously. I'm not married to some sort of rational process where they're trading costs and benefits. But the individual is doing some something, and how is that being informed or structured by this person in social space? Okay. All right. So, um, okay, I think I can skip this. Just said that. Um, so in economics, putting this identity or what I'll call a social category, like, his, like being black, Hispanic, gender, or whatever you want, is a standard practice in economic empirical studies of social economic outcomes. So we have dummy variables for race. We have dummy variables for ethnicity, region, state. We also can have all these interaction effects. You know, you interact gender um, with one of your variables. So we do this all the time empirically. Um, and so just to fix ideas, we consider education. If we say a children or adolescent underachieves in school, uh, we, but the underachieves is that uh, the child or the adolescent does not achieve the level of education that would be predicted by the economic costs and benefits, right? Getting a high school degree, as we know, is an extremely um, beneficial in terms of future wages, yet many people are not finishing high school. So why? Okay. Um, so when we think about that, what can account, so we, we, we can see, sorry, I should go back. We can see that it's not, again, this underachievement is not randomly or idiosyncratically just distributed within the population. There's certain groups which systematically do not finish high school, okay? So what is going on behind that? Um, what can account for these dummy variables, right? So if you put a dummy variable in a regression, say, oh, you know, black children don't achieve as much as we might expect them to, what's going behind that? We want to unpack those variables. So we want to unpack the black box of what it is behind these kinds of quote unquote decisions. Um, okay. So a basic economic model of, of an individual, okay, say, making some sort of, again, decision would be that the individual has some sort of what we call utility, okay, from their own choices or their own, a their own actions. The individual has some sort of idiosyncratic preferences. They may more or less like school, and these are considered to be exogenous. They're coming, you know, they're born with them, for example. There may be a technology or the constraints that the individual faces, so the individual is sitting in a particular school system, and that's, again, exogenous, and then this um, the choices lead to particular patterns behavior. So that's the sort of basic economic model. And it doesn't take us extremely far. So we can think about adding, for example, what we might call strategic interaction. And a strategic interaction is you might, some people call it pure effects, for example. Pure effects would be one example of this. You don't only think about the one person or one kid making some sort of decision you know, having their own likes and dislikes and deciding what to do. Now this kid is making the decision in the context of other kids making this decision. And for example, if more kids study at his school, then this kid may get a greater return for, from studying, and therefore you'd get a different kind of outcome. Okay, so you can add the social context by thinking about the individuals acting together, and we get what we call equilibria, which would say, okay, now that we look at this setting, we can see there's sort of an equilibrium pattern of behavior. But neither of these two ways of thinking about, um, of thinking about the differential outcomes take us very far in terms of understanding the social context. Because none of these have any um, social context to them. The equilibria that emerge could be equally, we could have a, as e easily an equilibrium where white kids don't graduate from high school as you do black kids, mm -hmm. right? Okay given the same circumstances. Whoops. So another way to go is to think about what we call preferences. So instead of thinking about these preferences as being idiosyncratic, right, that just different people have different preferences and we don't know where they come from, they're just exogenous, let's actually think about these preferences more deeply. So we can think about 
the idea of what people like and what people don't like. So some people like being, you know, doing well in school and some people don't. And this is you know, sort of thinking more deeply about preferences is really sort of goes back to Becker, right? And what George Akerlof and I have been trying to do is think about these preferences as coming from the social context. So whether a kid, for example, likes to do well in school or doesn't like to do well in school comes from, in some sense, their identity, their social identity, whether there's appropriate for them to be doing well in school, whether it makes sense within their environment. So should they do well in school? So some people might hate school, but feel they should do well, because that's what they've been taught they should do. It's appropriate for them to be doing well, right? Their parents have told them, you have to do well in school, even though they hate school. Maybe they want to be an artist, maybe they want to dig ditches, okay? So I want to make the distinction between what people like to do, which is what would be the classic economic preference, so when people hear preferences in economics, it's what, say, people like. I like oranges. I like bananas. Okay? And this is what we're trying to get at is what people think they should do or shouldn't do. So while I like a red steak, right, I shouldn't eat it because I'm killing animals. Okay? There's something, and, and, so, and, and that could be part of being a vegetarian. Okay? So I just want to make this distinction in preferences that George and I have been trying to push. There's a difference between what you like right, and what you should and shouldn't do. And in terms of actual behavior, these two, of course, get mixed. You don't really know when you see somebody doing something, is it because they like it or because they feel they should, should act this way? Right? But what we want to do is try to unpack these two things. Um, OK, so oh, where's my watch? All right, oh, somebody's keeping time back there. OK. So what? What, we're, what, we, what we propose is thinking about decision making with a, a, a utility function or a payoff function that's contingent on their identity. So individuals have, let me actually, I'm just going to skip to here. Okay, I'm actually going to give you a little bit of, an, a, a, of a mathematical presentation of this. So economists usually model individual decision making with a utility function that looks something like this. Uh, so an individual utility of a person is represented by some function, which is a function of own action. So this is actions of person J and actions of other people, not J. Okay? So um, what you might want to think of is, so suppose, you know, utility of graduating from high school, and this is own effort in school, and this is other people's efforts in school. Okay? <laughs> So this is the second tier of my things. This is the utility function with own preferences, plus I'm allowing for interaction between, between people. So the inclusion of other people is giving us this more strategic interaction or the possibility of externalities. Classic externalities in um, economics is something like pollution, but you can, you know, in our education example, you can think about the other kid disrupting the classroom. Right? So you're in a classroom, you want to do well, but then there's somebody else who's disrupting the classroom, and that affects the returns to my own effort in school. So I may do less of it. Okay. So this is a typical way we would model uh, utility. Oh, there we go. Um, so we want to amend this by adding the social context and identity. So first we want to think about individuals as being um, the social world as being divided into sets of social categories. And individuals think of themselves and others in terms of these categories. So you can think of black, white, male, female in an, in an organization. You might be able to think about management and workers. This is very general at this point. We're just simply saying that when you look at a particular economic environment, you should think about the social context in which these people are behaving or making decisions. And individuals think of themselves more or less consciously. Again, I'm not saying this is some sort of conscious thing. I walk around saying women, women, women on the top of my head right, all the time. But it's something that colors or shapes my decisions. Then there are norms which give appropriate behavior and ideal attributes of each social category. So there are norms that tell us what appropriate behavior is for people within that category. And then we can amend this utility function to include this little identity term. So we have own actions, others' actions, but then we have this little identity term uh, which we'll call the individual's identity. So it's the utility, say, that an individual will get from behaving more or less according to the norms for her category. So we have this little, as all extraordinarily general, I'm just putting out what we think are the important things to think about. 
So an individual's identity or feeling of sort of doing the right thing depends on own actions, others' actions conditioned on, that's the semicolon here, given individual self-categorization, how the individual thinks of themselves, herself, the individual's own attributes, so the extent to which the individual fits in that category, right? So I might want to be a woman, but I don't, I don't sort of fit the ideal of what a woman is supposed to look like. So we know that gender norms have changed very much over time. So this is something about, for example, what an ideal woman or an ideal African American should look like. And the norms are um, the norms for behavior. Okay, so overall utility, again, will depend on how actions affect the economic utility, as always. So we still want to keep that, right? We want to think about it, how it affects the self-image, again, contingent on acting as you should, which is the match between actions and the category norms. Fitting in, which is the match between J's attributes and the ideal of the category. And the status, which is of the assigned category, which is given just by the functional form. And in the basic case, person J chooses to maximize utility, chooses AJ to maximize utility, taking as given the category assignments, the own attributes, and the norms. But in general, a person could act to change their own category, own attributes, and social norms. So all of these things after the semicolon, of course, can change. And, and they can change by intervention as well. So back to this theme of intervention that we were just discussing earlier. Intervention can say, you know, actually, guys, you shouldn't think that this is the right thing to do. You know, it's not appropriate behavior to beat each other up on the playground. Actually, you should be acting in, a, in another way, right? And so these latter terms here can be affected, and they, in fact, do change in society, regardless of intervention. These are things that are changing over time. Just think of gender norms, for example, right? So they could, third, third parties, say, can af affect these norms. All right. All right. So let me um, get to the end here. Did you have a theory of the evolution? Uh, great question. The answer is no. So the, let me tell you, let me get, let me get to here. Ah, I'm not clicking fast enough. I thought I would show you how an equilibrium works, but I don't. Okay, let me get to here. So the answer. Or well, answer that question. Okay, so do I personally? have a theory of that? Who, who, who asked? Jim, OK. So do I personally have a theory of the evolution of those norms? The answer is I don't. I think this is the next step. There's several next steps in this agenda. So one of them, so I, for example, in the work that George and I have done thus far, we have examples of these third party interventions in norms. But I would not call them evolution of norms. So we have a, 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 a for example, a paper where we describe a principal in a high school intervening in the social setting of students, right, and giving students an alternative set of norms, okay, and, and seeing how different students, given their social background, might respond to this intervention. So we have a sort of a model of an intervention where we're thinking about children with different identities more or less responding to that intervention. So we think about, I have models of third party interventions, but the overall evolution of norms, the sort of, uh, that we have not tackled yet. Okay. okay. So Rachel, yeah. you, when you say norm, yeah. you have, is, is, there, is there a theory of what, the, what a norm is or how you would measure a norm or? Um, okay, that's getting to know. here, great, that's coming to this, right here, okay. Unpack the black box of norms, preferences, and habits. Okay, so, so where I'm really hoping that we can, what we can talk about and perhaps work on together, so let me just tell you what I've done so far, is we have this theory, this economic theory, where we bring in identity into a model decision making. So that's this first bullet point, okay? But what this, this model still has a, a big black box in it, which is the N, which is those norms, right? And those norms, um, we can, you know, again, I'm sort of going to um, put them together. So what, what I'm thinking we need to, to really operationalize this um, notion of identity and thinking about, say, for example, kids in school or individual decision making, is to unpack this notion of norms and behaviors. So we've, we've sort of, um, well, there's actually two pieces to it. One is, I think, which actually I don't think we quite have handled theoretically, frankly 
is this notion of what skills individuals bring to bear when they are you know, making these decisions. And those skills can then be shaped by social, their social upbringing. Okay, that's one thing. So we should be including more, this is the expansion part. We should be excluding more, okay, whatever we want to call these, these skills, habits, um, and so on. Um, I think we need a lot more detail on preferences as they are socially defined, so risk preferences, time discounting, and also unpacking this black box of norms, preferences, and habits as they're associated with social identity and social context. So what do we, what do we mean now when we're talking about normative behavior or you know, a person acting as they should right, in a social context? Is there a way that we can start to unpack that a little bit better, how it emerges from perhaps the way parents um, the way parents interact with children, the way other adults in society interact with children, as an example, and so on. And so um, I would be very interested in thinking, you know, there's a, this is, of course is a huge you know, set, of, uh, set of pieces of this u u utility function, but to think about how we can actually unpack this, we might be thinking about how to do this experimentally through also possibly particular interventions. Thanks. Yeah. This is so interesting. Um, but I, I, so you're describing norms as um, kind of uh, prescriptive things, what you should yes. do. But uh, there's kind of an enormous line of work on norms as simply defining the situation for you. That regardless of yeah. how long it should, uh, the, the first A term uh, has, uh, can just be defined by the group. That the group just makes you see the world slightly differently. And it's yeah. not about whether my group will accept it or not. It's just that the group kind of shapes my perception of the, the payoff. Right, right. Uh, right. So, so I guess what I'm just what I'm saying is that it's possible that your identity terms kind of under, would be underestimating the impact of identity because there are two things that groups do. One is that they define the situation for you. They help you imagine the payoff. And then the other is that they give you this impetus to conform to it or not. Right. So the norms, so again, this is why um, what I wrote up there was so extraordinarily general, <laughs> so it's this big N, right, and I didn't tell you what it was mathematically, and what you actually, when you start to sit and model a particular situation, that's when I've got to do those sorts of things. So it is both prescriptions, right, and it could also be how I understand my world, right, it could be both. So I, I have not specified, it's, not, it's very ill-specified at the moment. And what we do in, in this kind of literature is we go in and specify it for a particular context. So for, in the context of a high school, in the context of a workplace, and so on. And I think exactly what you said, that you can think of norms as prescriptives for behavior, that's sort of one basic notion. The other is that your group is sort of telling you how your world looks, right? So um, I, I don't, I'd love to keep talking, but we have a coffee break coming up, and I, and I want to make sure we get our coffee, and I'm happy to, all of us, I'm sure, have lots to talk to, to about to everyone. So thanks very much, and we'll see you soon.